Praise the Lord. Let's rise up together. We're going to pray for our choir in Lagos, our choir in Ikiti State, our choir in Anambra State. You've been doing creditably well. Our choir in Delta State and choir in all the various states in Nigeria, all the various nations. We're praying that God will use their ministry this year creditably well in Jesus' name. Why don't you please open your mouth and pray that in our churches, all our churches, all our churches, that the Lord will help all our orchestra choir ministering to us, encouraging us, inspiring us, lifting us up. And I want our leaders to please encourage them by the instruments they need. And give them the chance to do their practicing. As a blessing to us, let's be a blessing to them. Let's pray that as our converts come to the churches. And they listen to our choir singing. Those converts will like to stay. They like to remain. The world loves music. This is the food of the soul. Let's pray that they will contribute much, much more than ever before to the growth of the church. That the anointing of God will remain with them. The protection of God will remain with them. Any challenge, any concern at home, in their places of work, that will hinder them from being their best. That God will take care of those things and... They're strengthening them in the Lord while they're strengthening the church of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again. We bless your name for our choir, for our orchestra from all the states. We thank you because they're trying to be their best. And Lord, I pray their best will really be the best. Your anointing will be upon them. Your glory will be upon them. And I pray that you fill their personal lives and family lives with your blessings in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, they will not stumble. They will not fall. They will not backslide. They will be an encouragement to the church of the living God every time in Jesus' name. Help us who are their leaders and their pastors to be an encouragement to them. Never to provoke them privately or publicly. But to help one another washing one another's feet and one another's hands. And we pray for the old church. Get us standing together in Jesus name. We pray as we look at your word now you bless every one of us. Enrich our lives with your word. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. We're back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. And we're talking about something that this world, they see every time. They recognize every time in all the other fields except in religion. We're talking about Christian zeal. The zeal of a Christian. The zeal of a minister. But Christian zeal misunderstood and defended. Now when you see the athletes on the field and they give everything they've got and even when they perform so much that some of them might even die at the finishing line. You see the world in the amphitheater where they are clapping for them. And they are excited because they manifest zeal, enthusiasm. When you see all those uh, other people in society, in different professions, and they manifest earnestness, fervency and zeal nobody condemns them it's only when you come into the christian faith and then you see the zeal that people manifest then we misunderstand and we call it another name we're looking at acts chapter 26 i'm reading from verse 24 and as he thus spake 
for himself. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. In verse 25, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. When actually Paul knew that he was mad, people didn't call him mad. Look at verse 11. And I punished them out in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. There was a time that Saul was insane. He was mad. And he himself, looking back at the life that he lived before, he said, I was exceedingly mad against them. But you know, nobody called him mad at that time. They just thought he was doing the right thing. Now, when he came back to his senses, when he became normal, when he became righteous, when he became straightforward, and when he was calling people out of evil into something good, that's the time now they called him mad. It was zeal, but he misunderstood. Christian zeal is a burning desire. A burning desire to please God. A burning desire to do his will. A burning desire to advance the glory of God in the world in every possible way. That's zeal. But the people of the world will not understand that. When this desire reigns in God's ministers, that desire and that zeal and that fervency impels them to make any sacrifice and to evangelize and to labor and toil it, it makes them to spend and be spent if only to save souls and to please the almighty god that's the kind of zeal the lord wants us to manifest but please understand the people of the world they will not understand they will misinterpret the zeal and they call it madness insanity you are beside yourself much learning much prayer much study of the bible has made you mad sometimes that comment will come from our relatives our relations members of our extended family you are mad this is insanity you carry religion too much on your mind, on your head. You are drunk with religion. You do not hear what the people of the world are saying anymore. You become abnormal. That's what they think. But it's the zeal of the Lord. Whatever they say, however they construe it, however they interpret it, will remain in that zeal in Jesus' name. Psalm 69, I'm looking at verse 9. Psalm 69, verse 9. For the zeal of thine house has eaten me up, has consumed me, has totally taken away everything within, and it's not focused just on one thing. And the reproaches of them that reproached thee are falling upon me. Can you see the connection, the zeal and the reproach? The zeal and the insult. The zeal and the abuse because of the zeal of the Lord. Of the house of the Lord that etch him up because of that they reproached him. Psalm 119. Psalm 1. One nine, and we're reading from verse one three nine. My zeal has consumed me. My zeal has eaten me up. My zeal is taking the better part of me from the inside. My zeal has consumed me. See what follows. 
because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. He said, the more I see many other people forgetting the will of God, the word of God, the more I want to plunge myself into total dedication, abandonment unto preaching that word, promoting that word, proclaiming that word, publishing that word everywhere because the enemies have forgotten. I remember 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 10 and verse 11. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. But behold, the self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Do you see the connection? vehement desire and zeal when you have zeal for the lord and for the sakes of the lord it means you have a desire not just a desire a passion not just a passion is vehement and it is fervent it's fiery it is a vehement desire and what zeal ye what revenge in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter Colossians chapter 4 Colossians chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 12 Epaphras who is one of you a servant of Christ saluteth you always laboring fervently that's the zeal always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God for I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you what does zeal do it makes us a labor not just labor ordinarily not just labor kind of passively not just labor at convenient times but we labor and we labor fervently because of the seal and the world is not going to understand that if you manifest that zeal on the football field in soccer in any game or in cultural dancing or cultural event uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen in the papers in uh, one of the states in the south south of our country Recently, when they had their annual scene, and uh, you saw perhaps in the papers all the way that those the people appeared and the kind of gymnastics and the things they did that you might almost be afraid that wouldn't they kill themselves doing something like this? Nobody condemns that kind of zeal in the world. Is when you bring it to Christianity and you are that fervent and you are that committed and you are that given and abandoned unto that religion that christ himself has brought so that people can be saved it is then people begin to say this is madness and this is insanity you are beside yourself all i'm saying is the people of the world are more fervent in what they want to do than the people of God in what God has commissioned us to do. But you know, Paul the Apostle, he was mad, fervent, zealous, passionate when he was in the world. And now when he became born again, became a child of God, that same passion, that same fervency, and that same earnestness he brought into the Christian faith until Festus said, Paul, there's something going wrong. This is abnormal. This is too great. This is too fervent. You are mad. You are beside yourself. No, Festus, this is just Christian zeal. And how we wish that not only Paul, but every one of us will have that same fervency and that same earnestness and that same zeal in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. It says, For I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you not only for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Herapolis laboring fervently for everyone in prayers that they will be found 
perfect, complete in the will of God. I'm looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. It, it shouldn't have been something peculiar just to Paul alone or just to those early apostles alone. It's something that God intends and God desires for you and for me, for everyone. That zeal, that fervency, that passion, that until people begin to say you are mad, you are beside yourself. Christian zeal. And let it go on and move you on and drive you on. Even when people misunderstand it. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me the rest. Zealous of good. Us. While the world is zealous about games while the world is zealous about cultural tradition while the world is zealous about politics while the world is zealous about olympics then the people of god were saved and were sanctified and were saints so that will be zealous for good works so that we'll be able to say much more than the passion they demonstrate in the world and much more than the zeal they demonstrate in the world which you will demonstrate that in jesus name and, and it's a good thing it's not a bad thing at all although festus misunderstood don't allow the misunderstanding of festus to make you kind of quieting down and slow down and cool down get up and be zealous for the things of the lord in galatians chapter 4 Galatians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 18. Galatians 4 verse 18, but it is good. Everybody say it is good. It is good to be zealously affected, not only sometimes, not most of the time, always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you, always to be zealous. What a wonderful thing, it's a good thing to be always zealous for things that are good, for things that are righteous, for the service of the Lord in particular. In Numbers chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 10. Numbers chapter 25, we're looking at verse 10. The seal we come, we carry into the vineyard of the Lord. The zeal we carry into the ministry into which the Lord has appointed us, into which the Lord has called us. And we need to bring back that zeal, the zeal we used to have. And people knew deeper life, different from any other church during a retreat time. We we'll never go for family meeting, they just say it's gone with church, it's gone with deeper life. And uh, other times, maybe it is, you know, we have an assignment to go on missionary work. And in the zeal with which we pursue, the calling of God, the commission of the Lord upon our lives. And that's the kind of zeal the word Lord wants to bring back in this new year. It will come back in Jesus' name. Numbers chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous while he was zealous if you had read the whole story if you're not careful you might join festus and you might say finney has you are beside yourself and this uh, kind of situation, religion, has made you mad. Because, you know, uh, what had happened is that the children of Israel, they started joining themselves with the people of the enemies of God, the Moabites. And because of that, judgment came upon them. And they were dying. A plague broke out. And then there was an Israelite in the midst of that judgment, in the midst of that punishment, in the midst of the plague that came upon the whole land. And thousands of them died in one day. One Israelite then still went and took a Moabitish woman. 
And in the public was still going like that. And this man said, how could this happen? People are dying in their thousands because God is angry with what has taken place. And he took a javelin in his hand and he struck both of them. You know, if anybody did that, you might say, you're mad, you're beside yourself. But you couldn't accuse that man of madness because he was the one that stopped the plague. And the thousands of people that died, it was the man that didn't allow the plague to continue. You know, there are times you have to be zealous like that to stop evil. To arrest the situation. To destroy anything coming from the opposite camp. To pollute and defile and cause abomination in the house of the Lord. And then the Lord said, because he was zealous for my sake among them. That I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. And he shall have it. And his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Because he was, he was what? Zealous for his God. And made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the, Israeli, of the Israelite that was slain. Even that was slain with the Midianitish woman was Zimri. And the son of Salom. A prince of the chief of a chief house among the Simeonites. You see then the importance of zeal in the things of the Lord. A Christ-like zealous minister is preeminently man of one thing. He is earnest. He is fervent in spirit. He only sees one thing. He cares only for one thing. And that is to do the will of God. To spend his life and expand his life. And then he is swallowed up in this one thing. And that one thing is to please God. That one thing is to do whatever God appoints him to do. And he, do, he does that wholeheartedly. People like that, people like that, Festus will call mad. Festus will say, you are beside yourself. But I pray whatever they say and whatever reactions they have against the fervency of the Lord will not stop us in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 26. Whatever I did the message tonight to three parts. Number one, spiritual dullness concerning Christ's saving truth. Festus was dull. He didn't understand the zeal, the fervency. He didn't understand the might, the heart, the desire, the passion, the interest that Paul the Apostle had in this eternal truth. Spiritual dullness concerning Christ's saving truth. Number two, sober declaration of Christ's saving truth. Sober declaration of Christ's saving truth. Number three, skillful defense of Christ's saving truth. Skillful defense of Christ's saving truth. Number one, spiritual dullness concerning Christ's saving truth we're looking at acts chapter 26 verse 24 and as he thus speak for himself festus said with a loud voice paul thou art beside thyself much learning doth make thee much now before you react to criticism you need to understand who is criticizing you. How sharp, how intelligent, how spiritual, how enlightened is this man criticizing you. If the man criticizing you is dull, is ignorant, is foolish, is unreasonable. If the man criticizing you has no knowledge, if the man criticizing you is as dumb as a beast, then you don't want to come that serious. You know why criticism hurts us? 
because you're attributing much intelligence to the person criticizing you you are attributing much wisdom and you're exalting and elevating the man or the woman criticizing you and you think is more intelligent than he is analyze their criticism analyze their stand analyze their state of mind analyze where they are if a man in the valley is criticizing a man on the mountain by the analysis of who the man is and by the analysis of where the man is that will make you to understand how worthless the criticism is and if you do that every time you have people opposing you and people criticizing you and people knocking you down and people calling your names if you analyze who they are what they have how spiritual they are how intelligent they are their criticism will never 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 hurt you anymore now who is this man that is saint paul thou art much you are beside yourself and much religion has made you mad let's look at him chapter 25 chapter 25 of acts and i'm reading from verse 13 from verse 13 and after certain days king agrippa and benice came unto caesarea to salute who to salute who festus and when they had been when they had been there many days festus declared paul's cause Paul's case unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die. Before that, he which is accused have the accusers face to face, and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither, they be without any delay on the morrow i sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth against him when the accusers stood up they brought none accusation as such things as i suppose now we start to understand who festus was and when somebody says you're beside yourself much learning has made you mad anybody that will say much learning has made you bad he himself is afraid of learning is afraid of knowledge he himself is a lazy person not wanting to investigate or find out the very cause of the thing much learning has made you mad and now you says in verse 19 but they had certain questions against him of their own superstition you see that all he could gather about resurrection about christ about his death about the atonement about the sacrifice of christ about the resurrection of christ all festus could gather is that uh, they, they were talking about superstition superstition and when somebody like that so ignorant so unintelligent and so unwise and so foolish says you are beside yourself you are mad oh, why are you going to count that very serious why are you going to you know be sorrowful and be going about dejected unhappy because an unreasonable unwise foolish ignorant man has called you foolish and has called you unwise has called you mad and beside yourself he called the resurrection superstition and he said and uh, and is and of one jesus which was dead whom paul affirmed to be alive and because i doubted of such manner of questions he, he sold out himself Festus said, I, I doubted of I doubted of such questions. Somebody died and the person rose again, and now they're arguing about that. And because of that, they want us to judge this Paul. This man was dull. And when somebody is dull, unintelligent, 
and doesn't even know truth at face value when such a person opposes you when such a person criticizes you you don't want to take that too serious and then go back and lessen your consecration and lessen your commitment and lessen your fervency because an unintelligent dull man called festus who calls everything superstition and he doesn't understand about the resurrection because such a man is criticizing and using bad language he said because i doubted of such manner of questions i asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. I praise the Lord that we don't have to count all these uh, things, the people of the world, that they are saying. We don't want to count that serious anymore in Jesus' name. Hosea chapter 8, I'm reading verse 12. Hosea chapter 8, verse 12. I have reached to him the great things of my law. I have reached to him the great things of my law but they were counted as a strange thing think about that the greatest manifestation of the power of God is in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the greatest sacrifice is what Jesus did to atone for our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried. On a Sunday, he rose again. It's the greatest sin in the kingdom that will bring souls into the kingdom of God, get all their sins forgiven, and then get us reconciled unto God. And Festus counted that as a strange sin. A breaching to him i've spoken to him i've declared unto him the great things of my lord but they were counted as a strange thing how would you think about this you talk about salvation somebody counts this strange you talk about heaven somebody counts it strange you talk about sanctification holiness without which no man shall see the lord somebody counts it strange you talk about the power of the holy ghost that comes upon a man and sets you on fire for the glory of god and for the publishing and preaching of the gospel and somebody counts it strange and that person that doesn't understand the very basic the abc of gospel faith and of uh, saving faith that person and turns around and he says you are mad and you count him serious and you get offended because somebody who does not understand the abc of saving faith has said that you are beside yourself and has said that you are mad he is dull and because of his spiritual dullness that's why he's saying what he's saying and you don't want to count that serious you want to pity him and you want to look at him with pity and say lord open his eyes that he may see i pray god will open their eyes but the point is you never never get sorrowful again or you never get bitter again you never get unhappy again because somebody who is ignorant and unintelligent and he counts the great things of the kingdom he counts that as a strange thing you don't want that person to even touch your feeling at all. In Micah chapter 4 verse 12. Micah chapter 4. I'm reading verse 12. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord. And what else are we worried about? You know, you are following the way of the Lord. You know the thought of the Lord and the plan of the Lord and the way of the Lord and the word of the Lord and the assignment of the Lord and the plan of redemption. And you know what he has given you to do? And then there is one first or somewhere that says, you are beside yourself. Thank you, Festus. I know where you're coming from. I know where you are. I know your position spiritually. And I know you are in the valley. And your valley is so dark, you do not know the thoughts of the Lord. I'm not surprised you are saying what you are saying. You are saying what you are saying because of where you are. And because of who you are. And because of your lack of understanding. They know not the thoughts of the Lord. Neither understand his counsel. Paul the apostle understood that counsel that's why he said I have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel of God but Festus did not understand the counsel of the Lord and because he didn't understand the counsel of the Lord that's why he said Paul 
You are beside yourself, and much learning has made you mad, for he shall gather them as sheaves into the floor. That means he'll gather them, and then those who are for judgment, he'll judge them. I want you to understand something. Look at these people now. There's somebody, there are people who are condemned to die, and these condemned criminals have been matched out of their cells. And while they're going, and they're going to be gathered together to the floor so that they can be judged one of them looks up at you because maybe you're preaching in the prison and you are uh, trying to tell them come to know the lord so that even if you die physically you'll still be able to live forever and then one of those uh, criminals going to the stakes he looks at you and he says you are mad you are beside yourself much bible reading has made you mad and the fellow is about to die in a few minutes you'll pity him you, you not say oh i'm sorry for myself this condemned criminal says i am mad because he doesn't understand the counsel of the lord he doesn't understand the thoughts of the lord that's why he's saying what he's saying and we're told in jude verse 10 jude verse 10 tells us about these people and when next they call you mad and when next they accuse you and when next they try to put you down and it's don't mind him he's mad don't mind him he's beside himself don't mind him he's fanatical don't mind him he carries religion in there don't mind him he doesn't know what he's doing and you know who they are you know their position you know their place and you'll then stand on your feet and still maintain what you are maintaining jude verse 10 but these speak evil of those things which they know not that's why they are they speak evil of the things they know not why would you worry about them if you know what you're doing if you know what you believe if you are very sure about life eternal and you're sure about the uniqueness of christ and you're sure that he's the only savior and the only sacrifice and the only substitute and our sin bearer and then somebody who is totally ignorant of that then speaks against what he doesn't know that doesn't bother you in verse 10 they speak evil of those things which they know not but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves isaiah chapter 29 isaiah chapter 29 you know sometimes the people who say that they are knowledgeable in other areas but don't let that surprise you uh, i'm sure we have all been in school and that's why you can listen to the message in uh, the language you're speaking now and you can also read your english bible with understanding i'm sure you've seen some of our teachers at school uh, some of them are very very great in mathematics but then when it comes to english language you, you know you've been in their class that when they are speaking the language they kind of mutilate and murder and totally destroy the language that you have to control yourself not to laugh but when it comes to their mathematics and all their equations they write all those things very well but they mix the tenses together they are good in mathematics but they are woeful terrible in english language there are some people that are intelligent in things all that things but when it comes to the important thing and the knowledge of heaven and the knowledge of salvation they are woefully ignorant and therefore you're, you're not bothered by them you're not bothered because of what they say you know that even though they are knowledgeable in this area when it comes to life eternal and in things that have to do with eternal life they are completely ignorant that's why some of them might tell you you are beside yourself much religion much prayer or much fasting has made you mad in isaiah chapter 29 isaiah chapter 29 i'm reading from verse 11 and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed when men deliver to one that is learned saying reach this i pray thee and he saith, i cannot for it is sealed for first of all the word of salvation was sealed the knowledge of life eternal was sealed 
The knowledge of how to get to heaven was sealed. The knowledge of spiritual administration, operation, the working of the power of the Lord was sealed. And because to him, the knowledge of salvation, how your name will get into the book of life, how you can be saved, how you will know the Lord and walk with the Lord and walk victoriously in the life of righteousness and holiness for him. It was a sealed book. Then you cannot blame him when he called Paul who had opened the seal and the mysteries of the kingdom that were hidden from the foundation of the world have been revealed to him you cannot blame a blind man for telling for telling this paul the apostle whose eyes were opened you are beside yourself much learning has made you mad in verse 12 and the book is delivered to him that is not learned saying read this and I pray thee, and he says, I am not learned. Can you blame Belshazzar because he wasn't able to read the writing on the wall? Yes, he was a king. And yet he couldn't read the writing on the wall. Can you blame Festus? He couldn't read the writing. He couldn't understand the revelation of the Lord. And then instead of saying, I want to learn, instead of wanting to learn, he only told the man that knew about the writing and about the secret and about redemption story and about the plan of salvation. He only told the man, well, you are mad. You are beside yourself. I pray we will not be like that. I said we will not be like that. In 1 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 18. But the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. Foolishness. That's why a person like Festus, the preaching of the cross the preaching of the death of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for, for our justification, for our righteousness and to qualify us to be reconciled with God and to get to heaven. The preaching of that cross to him was foolishness. That's why he said what he said. I want to remind you once again, when people say things against you and they talk against you, they don't, don't just take their words I don't take their words from the dictionary and say this is the meaning of being mad. This is the meaning of being beside yourself. No, don't think like that. Who is using those words? Who is the person pronouncing those words? Who is labeling that accusation against you? Who is throwing that word at you? know his value and the value of his word will not be higher than the value of the man the meaning of his word will not be more than the meaning of his life if his life is meaningless if the life is worthless if his life is valueless then whatever words he throws at you the words have the same value as the life of that man. And if you think like that, it will never bother you anymore when one festival somewhere rises up and he says, Paul, you are beside yourself and much learning has made you mad. And that will not make you to slow down and then to retract and say, now they are saying I'm mad, I'm studying too much, I'm learning too much. I think I'll slow down. No, a scholar is a scholar. It would have been unfortunate for this world if um, Albert Einstein had slowed down. It would have been unfortunate for this world if, uh, you know, Dixie and all those people, uh, if they have slowed down, the people that gave us aeroplane or computer or internet, all these great, great things, achievements and, and inventions that they had, if they had given up because an ignorant person in the city had said, you are mad and you are concentrating too much on this. But they went on that's why the world is where the world is not the same thing the christian faith if we don't give up and we keep on studying and we keep on learning and we keep on dipping ourselves into the knowledge of the almighty then whatever they say will not affect us but we will change the world i said we'll change the world people like festos who counts learned people as mad they never change anything 
is as it was so it is and so it will ever be the people that make a change in the world there are people like paul the apostle that will go deep into the things of the lord and they will learn what they need to learn whatever name you call them and whatever insult you heap upon them for the preaching of the crosses to them the perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of god in second corinthians chapter four second corinthians chapter four i'm reading from verse three second corinthians chapter four verse three but if our gospel be hid it is he to them that what that are i want you to imagine how you are going on the road and you have your map you've been there before and you know where you are going and as you're going on that road you're going like that like that then there's somebody else is traveling but he's traveling now in the opposite direction and then he whips you down and when he whips you down you stop and then you lean through your window to the windscreen and then you say what's the matter and then he says who are you going to say i'm going to such and such a place and you know where you're going and you know you're going to get there and he is lost and then he says well I've, I've traveled that road i went down to that place and to that milestone and i don't think uh, you know the way will carry me there oh and you say you're sure that it will carry you there but he is lost is lost and then he says ah, you're going to follow that road you are mad and you're beside yourself you're not going to count him serious and say this man doesn't know what he's saying i know the way i know the road paul the apostle knew the way he knew the road and he knew that festus was ignorant of eternal life ignorant of the way to heaven our gospel is hidden from those who are lost is the lost person that is calling the person who has found the way that you are mad you are beside yourself and that doesn't bother you when you know that this man is lost and he has, he has missed his way and then he's accusing you and pointing to you look at verse look at verse 4 in whom the god of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of christ who is the image of god shall shine unto them and so you understand that when you know the value of the people the state of the people the mind of the people the ignorance of the people that say you are mind it will not bother you and it's because of the spiritual ignorance concerning christ's saving truth that's why they say what they say and that doesn't bother you a judge point number two sober declaration of christ's saving truth sober declaration of Christ's saving truth. I come to your Acts of the Apostles again. And I'm reading from verse 25. But he said, I am not mad. Was he angry? I said, was he angry? Now, how would you be angry with a little child that has no knowledge of even the alphabets? and of any of the even one syllable words that child knows nothing and then the child says something mistakenly and you know the child has not been taught you'll not be angry how will paul be angry with somebody who is lost and somebody who counts saving faith salvation redemption righteousness he counts that as a strange thing he counts that as superstition how do you get angry with such people you pity them how will you find somebody who is lost and then is going the opposite direction of where he ought to go and then he calls you mad because he's a lost man how will you get angry at them when you understand who people are and you know that they do not understand what they are saying you're not angry a preacher went to a particular church he was invited there to preach and then in their own culture that's the united states when you finish preaching like that members of the church some of them they will line up like this and shake your hand and say that's good i benefited so much and then that's good i benefited so much that's good i benefited so much and then as the people lined up like that uh, one woman was on the line and then she shook the preacher's side and said that is the worst message i ever heard in my life and then 
she left. And the man, you know, being this was not his church, he just said, thank you very much. And then the man went to join the line again. And the second time she came and said, thank you for coming. That's the worst message I ever had in my life. And the preacher said, thank you. And then the preacher now uh, went to see the pastor. You know, as they, not, as they were going home, the preacher said, uh, I had something embarrassing today that shocked me. As the people were greeting me after the service, one woman said, that is the worst message I ever had in my life. And uh, so the pastor said, is the woman like this, like this, like this? And the pastor said, how do you know? Yes. Oh, she said, that woman has a health problem. She has forgotten everything. Everything has gone out of her brain. The only sentence she knows is, that's the worst message I ever had in my life. And that anybody, even, even people are not preachers, when, he meets, when she meets them, that's the worst message I ever had in my life. And when she's talking to the children, that's the worst message I ever had in my life. That's the only sentence she has in her brain. She has a mental problem. Oh, and the preacher then took comfort and said, I'm not a bad preacher after all. <laughs> if you don't know the people... Who accuse you and the people who insult you and the people who abuse you and you think they are normal you think they are spiritual you, you, you'll get angry you'll get angry because of what they do and because of what they say but paul the apostle he knew festus and because he knew festus he wasn't angry he just said i am not mad most noble Festus, I like that. You don't repay them with their insult. You don't repay them in their bad language. I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak. I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. The Lord wants us to speak forth the words of truth and of soberness in Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, reading from verse 17. Bow down thine ear, hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing, if thou keep them within thee, they shall with thou be fitted in thy leaves, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee, have not I reached to thee excellent things in counsel and knowledge? And then in verse 21, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. That's what we have to preach, and that's what Paul the Apostle had. And he knew that if Festus had any other idea, it's because of his ignorance. He was declaring the words of truth. And then he says that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sent unto thee. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 10. Ecclesiastes 12, 10. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. You know, Paul the Apostle was so very logical from the, from the beginning, the commencement to the conclusion. Very logical. And if after you've given a logical message like that, a convincing message like that, a convicting message like that, a message that should drive a normal person to repentance and salvation. And then Festus still said what he said. He must have some spiritual problem. He must have eyes that see not, and ears that hear not, and hearts that understand not. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was reaching was upright, even words of truth, and the words of the wise as goats, and as nails fastened to the by the masters of their of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd in malachi chapter 2 the kind of words we need to speak and the kind of knowledge we need to give out and the kind of truth we need to emphasize saving truth saving truth that will get the people out of their sin and bring them unto the lord that's the kind of word that should be in our preaching in our messages that we should emphasize and drive home 
to the hearts of the people in Malachi chapter 2 verse 5 Malachi chapter 2 verse 5 yeah it tells us in verse 5 Malachi chapter 2 reading from verse 5 here is what he's saying there my covenant was with him of life and peace and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And that's what I can say about Paul the Apostle. The word of truth. The knowledge of truth. The truth that sets free. The truth that saves. That was what Paul proclaimed. And that's why King Agrippa said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Because of what was said, Agrippa was following after what Paul the Apostle was saying. But in the case of Festus, it's like, you are mad, I don't understand the jot of what you say. This is all super, a superstition to me. But in the case of Paul, the law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. That same word that Paul the Apostle gave them, he had given it in other places, and many people had turned to the Lord. If other sinners had been converted through what Paul the Apostle said, then this Festus, who is not converted but criticizing Paul, he is the abnormal one, he is the unintelligent, he is the blind one, he is the dull, dense one. All the other people have heard, and that same truth have turned them to know the Lord. Festus had his own problem in verse 7 for the priest's leaves should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the lord of hosts this is saving truth and when you give it out it will save your hearers in jesus name and you might have about a thousand people there and if you have about uh, you know 100 150 200 giving their lives to the lord then you know the seed is good the seed is the word the word is good and if anybody goes out of the place shaking his head and saying what kind of word is there looks like that preacher is fanatical and mad he has a problem you don't have any problem I said you don't have any problem. The same words that he has said and he ridicules and belittles and he tramples on the feet. That same word has brought other people to life eternal and real salvation and joy in the Lord. And he goes away in his ignorance saying, you are mad and fanatical and much religion has made you mad. He has a problem. We don't have any problem. I said we don't have any problem. In James chapter 1 verse 18. James chapter 1 verse 18. Of his own will begat ye us by the word of truth. Of his own will begat ye us by the word of truth. Just think about Paul the apostle. The word of truth that he preached. Converted people in Philippi, in Colossae, and in Rome, and in Thessalonica, and in Berea, and in Iconium. The same word that he preached, that touched many lives. Now Festus said, I don't understand this. You have a problem. Because it's the same word, the same truth, the same gospel that have been presented to many other people. And it had saving power, regenerating power, a converting power of his own will. Begat ye us with the word of truth. We, uh, that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Ephesians 1 verse 13 In whom ye also trusted After that ye heard the word of truth hey, Look up brothers and sisters I, I think we, we need to begin to evaluate things aright And evaluate people aright I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 people and I saw Festus among them. And I thought he was an intelligent man because he's a governor, a silent place, and he appears to have exalted position. And then I give them the gospel truth. 
and one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, number six, missing Festus. All the other people, they shake, they tremble. All the other people with tears of agony and sorrow. They repent and they become converted. And a change comes upon their lives. And number six, only Festus is wondering, what's happening to these people? Why are they crying? Why are they repenting? And why are they turning to the Lord? And the joy of salvation and the beauty of salvation is reflected on their faces and in their hearts. Then I'm going to change the impression I had about Festus before because if this is can be plain to all the other people all the nine people and these people surrender their lives to the Lord on the basis of hearing the same thing and it's only Festus that is saying you are beside yourself much learning has made you mad I'm going to change my understanding my evaluation my impression about Festus I know he must be dull evaluate people by their reaction to the saving faith to the saving truth when you speak to people and then you find a lot of other people from Thessalonica and Colossae and Philippi and from Rome and from Corinth every one of them giving their lives to the Lord and turning to the Lord and it's saving them and there's one man he calls himself by a high name and a high title and yet he's not intelligent enough to be able to know that this is the truth that everybody can see very well I thought he was wise now I know he's not wise I thought he was exhausted I know it's not exalted. I'm not bothered about what he says about me. I'm bothered about what I now know about him. What is plain and clear to all the people he cannot see. Pity them. I said, pity them. That's why Festus, you don't look at a person like Festus like that and then say, you know, uh, something is wrong with me. No, nothing is wrong with the preacher of the truth. Something is wrong with a fellow that cannot see what everybody else has seen. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, in whom he also trusted after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that he believed, he was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and then we're told in Psalm 119 I pray this will be your testimony give me a good good amen, amen. help me give an amen that will wake up somebody sleeping amen. you know sometimes I like and I don't blame you or can I blame you you've been sitting down since morning and you've gone through one two three four five six seven messages and this is number eight in fact i'm wondering why do you, why why does the program put me in number eight when he knows people are tired i think i just have number one number two number three and then i'm done then after that other people can come and then you can go to sleep praise the lord who draws the program by the way to put the gs as the last speaker don't tell me who it is praise the lord are you awake are you listening are you like festus you know somebody who has not heard what i've been saying he will say yes i am not festus i'm like paul the apostle and the word of the Lord will walk in your life in Jesus' name. Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, I'm looking at verse 13. I have chosen the way of truth. Is that your choice? Amen. That will be your choice. And it's truth you have chosen. Nobody will take it away from your hand in Jesus' name. I have chosen the way of truth, thy judgments have I laid before me. Verse 43, in verse 43, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgment. So we come to point number three now, skillful defense of Christ's saving truth. Skillful defense of Christ's saving truth. Here Paul the apostle was going to defend what he had said. He wasn't going to allow what Festus said to intimidate him or to push him back 
or to push him down or to trample him on the feet he still stood i want to remind you once again that paul the apostle was at this time a prisoner i want to remind you that was changed to another soldier he had bonds he had chains on his son and all that did not intimidate him at all he still stood as a preacher a preacher is always a preacher and god has made a preacher and a minister out of you anywhere you find yourself you remain firm on the truth in jesus name we're looking in attacks of the apostles chapter 26 and we're looking at verse 26 for the king knoweth these things he turned to agrippa don't allow the distraction to take all your attention don't allow festus to take all your attention don't allow the ignorant to take all your attention don't allow those who are spiritually dull to take all your attention don't allow the people that have no value for the truth to take all your attention he turned away from festus after telling festus no most noble festus i am not mad i'm speaking the word of truth and of soberness and then now he turned to king agrippa he said for the king no of these things before whom also i speak freely for i am persuaded i am persuaded did he give up what he believed no festus will not make a person like paul give up what he believed it's like if uh, you know somebody is a medical doctor and you know somebody another person is a patient and then the medical doctor went to the patient and he said this is what to take and that's what to take and that's what to take and then the patient then began to tell the doctor no doctor i think that it should be like this and like this and the doctor said but you've never been to medical school and you never know anything about what do you know about what you are talking about and the ignorant patient is adamant in what he is saying well well that changed the doctor no what you know you know what you have you have and what you experience you experience and the training you've got you've got and paul the apostle that knew the truth the saving truth and the truth that is able to pave the way the narrow way that leads to heaven the coming to festus is not going to change a man like that and thank god you have been at this con congress and you know what you know and you have what you have and you have experienced what you have experienced and the knowledge of the truths you have the saving truth no ignorant person will take it away from you in jesus name and if there's somebody like festus then confronts you and he says but this but this that will not shake you that will not turn you back you'll say i know what i know i said you know what you know and this truth, well, if Festus does not accept, other people will accept. And it will save them in Jesus' name. He said, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. But this thing was not done in a corner. And you know why Paul the Apostle said that? About the resurrection. Because of something that he knew. That agrippa knew he was a jew let me show you matthew chapter 28 matthew chapter 28 and i'm reading from verse 11 matthew chapter 28 reading from verse 11 and now when they were going behold some of the watch that is the watchmen came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done and they that and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel they gave large money unto the soldiers saying say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept and if this come to the governor's ears we will persuade him and secure you so they took the money and did as they were taught and this saying is commonly reported among the jews until this day everybody knew everybody knew about the resurrection 
And they knew that they had given the soldiers money to shut them up. That's why Paul the apostle said, King Agrippa, I'm sure you know this. Not only that, let me show you in chapter 27 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27 verse 52. In Matthew chapter 27 verse 52, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Christ rose up first. And then after that resurrection, many bodies of the saints that had been dead and buried, they also rose from their graves and went into the holy city. Well, which one is called the holy city? Jerusalem. They went into Jerusalem and appeared unto many. Everybody knew. They knew that Jesus rose from the dead. Not only that, many, many other people that had died before. And they accompanied Jesus Christ on that resurrection day. And they rose from their graves. And they went and they appeared everywhere unto many people. And so Paul, the apostle, said, King Agrippa, didn't you know that? I'm sure you know this. I'm, I am persuaded that she know. Because these things were not done in a corner and as the reason paul the apostle was very bold and it was a surprise to him that festus was in in the was in the country in the land and yet he couldn't tell he couldn't know how could you forget so soon it must have meant that his philosophy his, uh, his tradition blinded him so much he couldn't see the scene that everybody could see because it was not done in a corner i'm looking at um, second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 24 now what our attitude is supposed to be when people are ignorant when they oppose the truth unnecessarily ignorantly they might even do it fervently but you know it's because of their ignorance what are we to do second timothy chapter uh, chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Never, never. You'll not strive. But be gentle unto all men. Gentle to all men. Especially the ignorant. Especially those who are blind. Especially those who don't know the way. Especially those who speak evil of what they know not. Especially those who speak about great matters of the Christian faith as a strange thing. It says you'll be gentle to all men apt to teach and patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth our prayer is all those who have been blinded their eyes will open all those who do not see god will make them to see and when we go out to present the gospel we'll present it with conviction we'll present it with courage we'll present it with real understanding we'll communicate the gospel in a powerful way in the normal way and i pray that the word of god will take effect and convert them and turn them around in jesus name and we will be of the number of the ministers that will turn many unto righteousness and and they that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will it's something you don't want to forget is the zeal the burning desire that we find in paul the apostle the fervency that we find in paul the apostle and everywhere he was he didn't look at his physical condition he just looked at the goal before him and at what the lord had called him to do and as god is sending us out from this place to go back uh, to the field the missionary field the evangelistic field and the pastoral field where we came from the fire of God will burn your soul. I said the fire of God will burn your soul. That same fervency and zeal that we have seen in Paul the Apostle and we have seen in other people, it will be in you, it will be in me, it will be in all of us in Jesus' name. 
now is nobody is calling you much nobody is calling you fanatical nobody is calling you that you are beside yourself looks like the fire is not burning enough but when you begin to hear somebody rising up and somebody say you are mad somebody say you're fanatical somebody saying that much religion and there's a christian faith you are drunk then you know you are in the right place and you're doing the right thing if everybody is praising you saying we like your own kind of crescent you're cool and you're patient and you slow it down and you are reasonable with it you are not as mad as those people you're not as those people that take madness with religion if they're saying that to you god forbid i said god forbid but when the people, some of them, when they begin to throw criticism at you, then you rejoice and say, thank you, Lord. Now I know I'm in the right way. And this right way, you'll never leave it in Jesus' name. Are you there already? I said, are you there already? The Lord will keep you there. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God will increase your zeal. That God will increase your fervency. That God will increase the passion and every, the fire that you have within. Until people will take note of it. And then they will say whatever they want to say. Why don't you open your mouth and say, Lord, put me on fire. Put your fire within me. Put your zeal and a fervency within my heart. Lord, I want to see you. I don't want anybody shouting there as if you want to disturb other people. Let's say, uh, you know, work together. Appreciate, uh, appreciate one another. I love you. Love me too. And don't disturb the flow of the message. Let's talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Put your fire within me, the passion within me, and the zeal within me. And help me, Lord, that I'll be able to run this race and preach this gospel and emphasize the truth of your word open your mouth the lord wants to hear you pray don't allow physical tiredness uh, to kind of silence you so that this word of the lord will take effect and be powerful and mighty in your very life pray that's the word of truth the word of truth the word of truth